Hello and welcome to iNerdius and the Science Fiction Randomly playlist. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about a magazine, I guess you would call it a fanzine, that I subscribed to a long time ago called Empire for the SF Writer. And this was a magazine that was written by successful or at least professional science fiction writers and editors about how to write science fiction, what editors looked for in science fiction stories. And I don't know how I happened across this magazine, but I'm glad I did. I read it cover to cover, every issue. The first issue that I have here is from, this one right here is from 1981. This is number 24. It has articles in it by Joel Rosenberg, Daryl Schweitzer, Stephen Golden, Mary Kittredge, Barry Longyear, Jack Williamson, Barry Malsberg, Don DeMassa, and then an interview with Thomas Dish. What was really interesting, what was unique about this magazine compared to all other magazines that were out there, all other all other fanzines and professional magazines and pretty much everything else that I ever read was that anyone could submit them a short story and they would choose one short story per issue, publish it, and then publish critiques by the professional writers and editors. That section was called Crazy Diamonds and in this issue, there was a story submitted by a guy named Fred Singer with critiques provided by Thomas F. Monteleone, Michael Bishop, and others. And pretty interesting uh, that this was a thing, actually, back then. I actually subscribed. You can see I actually I cut out the uh, back and sent in a subscription. I don't know if I was already subscribing before this issue, but I did subscribe. Issue number 25 here. There is an article in here by Stanley Schmidt, who was the editor of Analog at the time, Analog Magazine. There is an article in here by Ellen Datlow called What Omni Buys? This is when she was the editor, the fiction editor for Omni Magazine. There's another article here called how to Sell to Isaac Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine by Daryl Schweitzer and George H. Sithers, who was the editor of Asimov's at that time. There's an article in here by John Morrissey, who is a writer um, that I actually have a couple of books by. He's not really well known right now, but I have a couple of books by him, or at least one book by him, that I intend to talk about because it was one of my favorite science fiction books way back then, and I plan to reread it and talk about it in a video. The Crazy Diamonds submission is called Mind, M-Y-N-D, and it is critiqued by, among other people, Gene Wolfe. You know, imagine having Gene Wolfe critique your short story. Uh, that's just um, crazy. Uh, maybe that's why it's called Crazy Diamonds. So what did Gene Wolfe say about this short story? This story could be written successfully in at least three ways. The conventional approach would do it as a problem story, Dow or Mind, characters in the story I'm assuming, or the whole bunker bunch would have a problem and the story would describe their struggle to solve it and their eventual success or failure. A less conventional approach would be to treat it as a character study. We would be given insight about Dow, what kind of man he was and what kind of life he led in the bunker, why he liked Mind, why he was not liked by women, and so on. A still more experimental piece might make the atmosphere of the bunker its central character. We would come to feel what it was like never to see the sun. It's kind of interesting that Gene Wolfe would point that out. We would come to feel what it was like to never see the sun, to live a hundred miles down, to know that humanity was nearly extinct. As it stands, mind does not succeed in any of these ways. Hmm. Interesting. And then he goes on, he gives some tips. Now, he's basically just asking a bunch of questions. He does end with, on the positive side, mind is better written 
than most of the Crazy Diamond stories I've seen. It isn't professionally written, but at times it comes close. So that's kind of cool. Oh, interesting. This is what he writes next. Mr. Ferguson should read short stories until he learns what a short story is. And he should type the words, I am going to tell you something cool on a little card and tack it over his typewriter. The author of a story is telling the reader, in fact, promising that he will tell about an interesting series of events, person, or place. If he doesn't come through on that promise, he has failed. So, interesting writing advice from Gene Wolfe in number 25 of Empire for the SF Writer. Number 27 has an article by Charles L. Grant, an article by Stephen Spruill, an article by Susie McKee Charnas, article by Stephen Golden, an article by Pat Cadigan, another one by John Morrissey, an article by Horace L. Gold, another by Barry Malzberg. Then there's columns, Mary Kittredge, Gene Wolfe, I guess, had a column in this called Teacher Feature, Achieving Dramatic Scenes. Daryl Schweitzer, Don DeMassa, and then the Crazy Diamonds story in this issue is called Curve of the Snowflake. And it was critiqued by Jacqueline Lichtenberg and Lee Killo. So that's kind of cool. Also, there's a letter column in this. And in this one, there are letters by Hal Clement. Very long year. I mean, chock full of writing advice and commentary by professional writers. This is number 28, summer 1982. There's an article in here by George Alec Effinger, an article by Rudy Rucker called Science Fiction, Mathematics, and Me. And the Crazy Diamonds story is critiqued by Damon Knight, among others. That's pretty, pretty neat. By the way, the editor-in-chief was Mary Kittredge. Joel Rosenberg was an editor. Then number 29, um, the short story. This one has an article by Park Godwin, an article by Aldous Budras, George Alec Effinger, then the Crazy Diamonds story is critiqued by, wow, Michael Swanwick, Hal Clement, George Sithers. Pretty amazing. Just imagine sending in a short story to essentially a fanzine the fanzine published by professionals and having it commented on by people like that. This is number 30. Another article by Stephen Golden, Park Godwin, the Crazy Diamonds story is commented on by Michael Bishop, F.M. Busby, Stanley Schmidt. There are letters in here. Steve Perry has a letter, John Betancourt. I mean, really interesting. So this is the last issue that I have. Issue number 31. They changed the format inside a little bit. George Alec Effinger has another article in here. And the story that was submitted for critique this just did not have a good table of contents, so I have to go through it. It's called Morning Song, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G Song, critiqued by Marion Zimmer Bradley. She writes, To get the worst over first, if this crossed my desk when I was reading for an anthology, I wouldn't buy it. I probably wouldn't read past page two or three if that. Hmm. It may be what teachers of creative writing are fond of calling well-written, but stories are not about beautiful writing. It may have a good idea, but stories are not about good ideas. They are about people. And the people in the story are not people. They are only names on the paper. That's pretty harsh. Then she analyzes more about what she doesn't like about it, mainly the characters. Um, wow. Um, still pretty, pretty amazing that you could send in a story and have it critiqued in depth by extremely successful and well-known 
writers and editors. Um, what I like about this, I mean, this is just amazing to me. I don't know if there are any more uh, issues after this. This is, like I said, this was number 30. This was number 31, summer of 1983. So I believe I had more of these. I know I sent stories in. I don't know if one was ever published and critiqued. I'm assuming not, since I don't remember that happening, although I have to admit, in the back of my mind, I kind of think I did submit a story and have it published and critiqued, but I could be wrong about that, since I didn't save it, and I try to save all this kind of stuff, so I don't know. Um, what I love about it, though, is I have never seen anything like that. Definitely for the times, it was unusual. It is one of the things that I want to talk more about in terms of science fiction and fandom, uh, especially, which is that connection between the professionals and the fans, i.e. the readers, which I don't think existed in other forms of entertainment and literature at the time. Definitely not in the earlier part of the 20th century. If it did start to happen in other forms of literature, um, and other forms of entertainment in the 20th century, it probably happened as the result of sci-fi conventions expanding into other realms of entertainment. That's my theory anyway. I mean, I guess, and I'm including, and I'm including comic book uh, conventions, comic book shows in that as well, because these were things where you, the reader, the fan, could go and not just purchase things, not even just get a signature. I mean, book signings have been a thing for a long time. But interact with the writers themselves and the artists, especially in the comic book world. And not only that, with fanzines and the way panels were operated at conventions, are operated at conventions, you could interact in a more substantive manner than just by getting a signature from somebody. And so this fanzine, Empire for the SF Writer, is, in my opinion, the embodiment of that. It was intended for wannabe writers. It was intended for writers who had not made it yet, who had not sold anything yet. It was professionals trying to help unpublished science fiction writers get published. And I found that to be really invigorating back then. I started high school in 1980, so at that point I was a full-on science fiction fan. The only thing I had not done up to that point was attend a science fiction convention. I had gone to comic book shows and probably had encountered some comic book artists by then, although to be honest, I'm not sure that had even happened by that point. But this kind of thing, this would have been the first fanzine that I was aware of. This would have been the first publication, the first periodical that was not a professional, slick, or digest size magazine that was published just for entertainment purposes, for the reader to buy and read, giving their money over to the magazine who paid the writers, and that was basically the end of the interaction except for the fact that you could write letters in and potentially get them published, as I had one published in Asimov's at around this time, actually, and Asimov himself replied to that letter in, in the magazine. To me, Empire for the SF Writer exemplified what I came to understand the science fiction community to be, which was an interactive community of readers, fans, professionals, writers, editors, agents, artists, booksellers, especially when I started going to conventions and discovered that it wasn't just about getting a book signed or something, listening to a writer speak, asking some questions. There was more going on. You could stand in the hallway and talk to Jack Chalker, for example, or you could sit in the bar and talk to Peter Straub, for example, both things that I did at conventions, and more, a lot more than that, obviously. This culture of the science fiction writers, not just the writers, the editors as well, being involved in 
reaching out to the science fiction wannabe writer with advice on writing and how to incorporate science and what specific editors were looking for for specific magazines and what they didn't like about stories that they weren't going to publish for everybody to see, not just in a rejection letter to one writer, but actually put out there for all to see. Pretty impressive in my opinion. And I don't know of anything that's happening in the world today that does that. I don't know if there's anything online where you can do that, where you can submit a story as, as an unpublished or amateur level writer and have a panel of professional writers, editors, agents, whatever, critique that story in a public forum. Maybe that's done at some sci-fi conventions. I know that some like Dragon Con and others have writers workshops. So that might still be happening there, but not certainly in not in a print format. And I don't know that it's happening online. So that would be super cool to find out if there is something like that happening online. So anyway, there you have it. That is my video talking about Empire for the SF Writer, a magazine that I subscribed to essentially from 1981 into 1983. Thank you very much.